What's up skeptics, Thomas Westbrook here. My guest today is a world-renowned magician and mentalist based in Las Vegas. He is a master of deception, even managing to fool scientists for over four years at the McDonald Research Institute at Washington University, convincing them that he possessed telekinetic psychic powers and showing just how easily anyone can be fooled. He helped expose the faith healing charlatan Peter Popoff in 1986, and for years he managed the James Randi Million Dollar Challenge, a $1 million prize for anyone who could prove under proper scientific controls that they possessed paranormal abilities. He's developed magic tricks for Chris Angel, David Blaine, and even the legendary bullet catch trick performed by Penn and Teller, who called his show the greatest mentalism act in the world. He has appeared on ABC, The Rolling Stone, Joe Rogan, Chris Angel, Mind Freak, Sci-Fi, and way too many other shows to list here. He is a legend in the world of scientific skepticism and a warrior for truth. Without any further ado, I give you the one, the only, Banachek. Now, Banachek isn't a supernaturalist. He is the greatest mentalist alive, no question about it. It's the late 1970s. The Cold War is in full swing. The U.S. government, having just received word that the Soviets are experimenting with the possibility of psychic warfare, have set up their own program to investigate the possibility of the phenomenon. Alleged psychics began emerging, like Uri Geller, claiming he can move objects with his mind and psychokinetically bend metal, making it melt in front of you. And while his trickery would later be exposed, he even managed to pull off his feats under the watchful scrutiny of parapsychological researchers. In response to this, two skeptical magicians volunteer for a psychic research program at Washington State University called Project Alpha under the guise of psychics to show that without proper scientific controls, even scientists can be fooled. I'm joined today by a very special guest named Banachek or Steve Shaw, and he was one of those two alpha kids who fooled the scientists. You're sitting there in the lab. What is going through your mind as they start putting silverware on the table and asking you to bend it? Depends on the stage, right? I mean, in the very beginning, we thought that they were going to be using proper scientific controls, that they would have cameras behind one-way mirrors, and um, they would be observing us a lot closer than they were. So we thought that we might get caught. So it's this thing of don't make it look like a magic trick. Make it look like it's real. Take your time. Pace yourself. Bend things on a micro level, not on a macro level, where they ha actually have to measure it to find out whether it's bent or not. These are the things that are going through our heads. You know, who's watching us? Is there a magician in the lab? that's watching us are they trying to catch us or are they just observing us so you were working also with uh, the magician james randy who's also very skeptical of this stuff and he had provided a list of several caveats to the the scientists in order to safeguard against some of the trickery were you aware at the time that he had given them the caveats i was aware at the moment that the scientists showed us the caveats read them and things like uh don't work with more than one object at a time don't let more than one subject work at a time because they could misdirect you uh mark everything on a macro or a micro level they showed me the list and they had a good laugh they said this would make you very uncomfortable there's no way we can follow that kind of protocol I and mean, who is Rand Andy trying to send us this list, we can conduct this half ourselves without his help. So it's kind of the, the mindset that like scientists are used to, They're, they work on lab rats, and lab rats don't lie. Yeah, well, this is kind of what they thought about kids and teenagers. They thought that they didn't lie. Obviously, they didn't have children themselves. In the UK, they were working with very young kids, and the only way they caught those kids was quite by accident. They left the cameras running, and the moment that the adults left the room, the kids were taking the silverware that they couldn't bend with their little tiny hands because they were so young, and putting it under their feet and stepping on it and bending it that way. That's what fooled them. That's what fooled them, and that's how the kids got caught because of the cameras, yes. Oh, Jesus. So, so for you, as soon as they said that they were scrapping that list, did that take a load off your shoulders? And Not really, because, hey, maybe they're just saying that. Maybe they're just trying to make us feel comfortable. Um, and maybe that's a, a sort of a double, you know, blind kind of thing that they're doing, but not double blind. Like a misdirection. Like a misdirection, yeah. yeah, to make us feel comfortable so that we would feel that we could conduct any trickery we want and not get caught so that we would get caught, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It blows my mind, though, that you were able to pull this off, you said, for four years? Four years, 180 hours uh, total. So basically, we were going back and forth. We were going on holidays. We were leaving our job. We lost money doing this, going there to, to be tested by the scientists. But we convinced them that we could bend metal with our mind. We convinced them we could move objects with our mind, that we had other abilities outside the boundaries of known science. What, what were you hoping as, as a kid? Like, was it kind of, this is just exciting, fun, I don't know what'll happen, but we'll, we'll see, like... 
or was it something that like you were based in like noble goals? I'm going to, you know, expose these uh, psychic. Well, something we didn't say here, um, we kind of left it towards the end, uh, is that I was actually working with the amazing Randy, hence the reason Randy knew every test we were doing. But he was giving the scientist every opportunity to detect that it was trickery, every opportunity to use proper science, because he would find out exactly what what, what tests we had just performed, and then he would immediately send them a letter, look, if you're ever doing this type of test, you may want to do X, Y, Z. They never caught on that the amazing Randy knew that we were doing those particular tests. You see, for years, scientists that have been there was no evidence of ESP under proper scientific controls because of lack of funding. It was my contention. It was Randy's contention. And Mike Edwards, the other kid that was there with me, was also a magician, unbeknownst to the scientists. It was our contention that it had nothing to do with funding. It had to do with them all going in with a pro-biased opinion. In other words, people were attracted to parapsychology because they believed in parapsychology or they wanted it to be genuine. And they were not going to use proper scientific controls to find out whether it was real or not, but rather they were going to be documenting what they already believed. And the other thing was they thought they were too smart to be fooled. We thought because they had PhDs, uh, they wouldn't listen to the expert opinion of somebody who didn't like the amazing Randy, but basically had a PhD in magic, even though that's not really a thing, but could detect the trickery, understand the body language, understand what looks like magic and what is going on and could explain it to them. And that's exactly what happened during those four years. They refused his help, even though he was willing to give his help. Um, And had they accepted it, of course, we were working with Randy, so Randy would immediately said, yep, you know, they're working for us. I mean, we put a lot of rules in place for ourselves. We said that um, if they ever ask us if we're magicians, we have to say yes. If they, they never ever, asked you. If they ask us if we're working with the amazing Randy, we have to say yes. The closest they ever came was right towards the end, towards the end of the four years, when uh, Randy was at a conference, a parapsychology conference. And he let out two rumors. And they were pretty close to identical rumors, but slightly different. One was the truth, that Mike and I were working with the amazing Randy to fool those scientists. The other one is that those scientists were working with Mike and I and Randy to fool the rest of the parapsychological community. So when we showed up next time, they said, hey, we heard these rumors. We heard that you and Mike were working with the amazing Randy to try to fool us. And Mike and I are both in our heads going, uh-oh. We need to come clean on this. And then they started laughing. They said, yeah, there was even a funnier rumor than that one. It was that we were working with Randy and you guys to fool the rest of the parapsychologists. They never, ever asked us. Had they had done research on my background, they would have found out that I was posing as a psychic. Not that I was posing, but they would have found out that I was a psychic, that I had these abilities. Because Randy and I had set it up. I had written Randy many years early when I started out. I said, if you ever need a kid to fool scientists, I'd be happy to do so. Only if I can come out and say it's an illusion afterwards. And Randy says, well, if you do any newspaper articles, or anything like that, make sure that they think that you're a genuine psychic so we can set that up so that if they do any background checks on you. Had they done background checks on Mike, they would have found out that he was an escape artist, a magician, uh, but they never did. Where would they have looked for something like that at the time? This was pre-internet days. Local newspapers, a couple of phone calls, that's all you have to make. Gotcha. Coming out of that, though, when when you finally broke the news and you you revealed that it was trickery, How did they react? How did they respond? They did not want to believe that it was trickery. I have the phone call um, of one of the the scientists, and uh, they were not answering the phone. We had a press conference in New York, Time Life Building, where we came out, we performed, and uh, Randy's there with us, and uh, Randy says, why don't you tell them how you do this? And we got up there, we said, yep. Uh, it's a hoax. We've been fooling you for the last four years. And we said this at the Time Life building. It was a major, huge thing. All the newspapers hit it from uh, the New York Times. I mean, every international paper hit it as well. They were not answering their phone. They were waiting to hear from Mike and I. I called one of the scientists back. And uh, like I said, I still I have the tape. And um, I said, well, what do you, he said, I, we've heard this thing that you're working with Randy to try to fool, you know, fooling us all these years. And I said, well, what do you think? And they said, well, I don't think it can be true. And I said, unfortunately, it is. And then he just starts asking all these questions about every single experiment, just looking for one thing that he could hold on to that might be genuine. So he, it was it was a desire to believe. It, it was, was a desire a, to believe. Absolutely. 100% desire to believe. Does he yeah. still think that it's, it was true? or does I, he... You know what? I actually saw Peter Phillips give a lecture um, on Project Alpha. Somebody invited him. I wasn't supposed to be there originally, but I ended up showing up. And um, 
it's really interesting, but Peter Phillips supposedly, he, well, he says, not supposedly, and I believe him on this, he said he was reluctant to actually be the person testing, but he was the only one that had an interest in parapsychology, so he was chosen by Washington University in St. Louis to, to, to run the Mac Lab, which is the laboratory that tested us. I think he still, he doesn't believe that we were true, I don't think so, but he still believes in, in parapsychology, he believes in that type of stuff. He said in this, in this thing, he started the whole lecture, he said that the reason he got started was because there was a man that levitated a small table and he knows that it was real. But when we were working with him, there was a man that also levitated a table and we tried to show him a photograph of the guy putting his thumb under the table and lifting it up. So we, we were actually trying to expose this other psychic that was there because we didn't want anything to do with him because it was very crude in his methods. And uh, he refused to listen. He basically wanted to believe that that guy was genuine as well. So, yeah, he definitely believes in, in uh, paranormal abilities still. He just thinks that we, and he said it himself, we were very good at what we did. How many, what percentage of parapsychologists do you think are just genuine believers and who are really seeking the truth? Or do you think that some of them are just like doing it for attention or for money or, or I something? I think that I would, I, I couldn't give you percentages, but if I was to guess, I'd say at least 90% believe that it's real i mean you know you start doing something and you're not getting any results you kind of go in another direction at some point right unless you believe there is something there you keep searching for it so i i think that most of these people just they they do believe that it's real and there's a certain amount of loss aversion too where you're you think i've spent so much of my life or i've spent so many hours yeah. or so many months really looking into this and then pouring you know my everything into it believing it looking for evidence i found something that seems true like i don't want to lose that i don't want to right you know feel like i've I've wasted my life or wasted my time. Yeah, there is there is always that. I mean, we have that in our personal lives, right? We stay in relationships much longer than we should sometimes simply because we've invested so much time and energy, even if it's a bad relationship. And I think it's probably the same thing with parapsychology or any of those areas that we go into in our life where we start working on something. We've invested so much time. Why give it up? Why go do something different? Banachek, break up with woo. <laughs> so after that, how long was it after that before you started working with Randy with the Million Dollar Challenge and with testing paranormal and supernatural claims? Yeah, the Million Dollar Challenge came much later. I think it was uh, Randy was doing most of the testing. And I think there came a point where Randy just didn't have the time to do it as much anymore or the energy to do it. And he was doing other things and other projects. And they brought me in and asked me if I wanted to be the director of the Million Dollar Challenge. And who's going to say no to that? So, what did you do between the... I, I'm a performer. I, I perform. So you were performing always full performed. time. I performed that. even back in the days when I was working Project Alpha. I started performing back in those days. Yeah. Strictly mentalism, or Strictly, do you do sleight of hand and stuff as no, well? I I can't do sleight of hand. I do the magic, but I started out. I'm actually the one of the only mentalists that I know of um, that started out doing mentalism. And when I started out doing mentalism, I didn't know there was a subset of magic called mentalism. I just knew that there were guys that con people using tricks. That's what what, all is, that what I is mentalism for, for our listeners who? Mentalism is a simulation of psychic phenomena using trickery. Well, that can be sort of redundant, right? But, but we admit that it's trickery. We take our five known senses to create the illusion of a sixth sense. We get on stage and we get up there and we're using magic. We're using magic and maybe the magic's a form of psychology or verbal, nonverbal communication or just straight up sleight of hand or some other form of trickery. We're using it to simulate psychic phenomena. So when you say magic, you're not talking about Hogwarts. You're talking about doing things that just when people are looking one way, you go the other. Yeah. Siegfried and Roy uh, did uh, tricks with uh, lions and tigers uh chris angel and uh and uh david copperfield do tricks with beautiful women i do tricks with information do you ever do um i, I know some performers do massive feats of memory they, they'll memorize massive amounts of information right. and then then they'll use that you know to whether it's counting cards or something like that. Like, do you ever implement that into your tricks? Do you use mnemonics at all? I use a lot of mnemonics. Uh, you know, I'm dyslexic, so I have issues with memorizing certain things. And I come up with little clever ways of, of memorizing things. Even my name is sort of a bit of a mnemonic for back in the day. Everything, Almost everything about me somehow has some sort of psychological aspect. In my early days, you mentioned Stephen Shaw. Nobody really knows that name anymore unless you go and dig back into my past and take a look. But I was doing a lot of shows, and um, I did a, a corporate gig one time, and the CEO got up there, and I was very young, so I couldn't say, hey, just read it the way it is, or I didn't, and I also didn't have a cassette or anything that had my introduction on it. It was written. 
And he says, oh, I don't want to memorize this. He says, I'm just going to talk about you. I know a lot about you, and I'm going to get up there. And he got up there, and he said, oh, I've been on the Today Show, CNN Live. He's done this. He's done that. Please welcome Stephen. What was the last name again? I was like, oh, great. Next show, very next show, same thing. CEO wants to introduce me. He wants to give his own introduction. I said, yeah, the last guy forgot my name. It's Steve Shaw. Oh, yeah, Steve Shaw. I got it. No problem. Gets up there, does an introduction, can't remember my name. Third guy, and I'm really emphasizing now that the last two guys forgot my name, gets up there, does the exact same thing. Last name, couldn't remember it. Yeah, so he talks all about all these great things he's seen me do and, and how many times he's seen me and everything else. And I started thinking about it. Why can't they remember my name? And I realized it's a very common name, Steve and Shaw, very common names. No real hard syllables in there. You know, there's a little but not really. So I wanted something that was a mnemonic because these were all older guys, something that they would remember, maybe even make fun of. And I wanted something that had at least three hard syllables in it. And I wanted it to be a one person name, just one, one person name. And there used to be a TV show about an insurance detective called Banachek. It was spelled C-E-K, the Polish version of the spelling, or oh, the Czechoslovakian spelling. And um, I changed it slightly. I put C-H-E-K because I didn't want people trying to figure out how to pronounce it and you know, messing it up constantly. But I thought these older guys would remember the old TV show, right? So when it came time to actually introduce me, they've now got a hook. They've got something that they've hooked it onto, a mnemonic. It's a memory thing for them. And if they didn't know the TV show, they had to ask me how to pronounce it. And it's worked ever since. What about for, for your shows when you're performing tricks? Are there aspects that you use with uh, like memory techniques? Yeah, absolutely. It? There's a lot of stuff I try to memorize ahead of time. Um, you know, I'll walk around, I'll look at people and things, and, and I've, I've got to memorize certain things, so I associate them with different things, yeah. And, yeah. and, not, and, and to some people a... that don't know what a mnemonics are, mnemonics are sort of, it's a mental association. You create these associations. It's like, let's say it's a very simple version of that is one is gun, two is shoe, three is tree, four is floor. So if I want to memorize a loaf of bread, I imagine the gun shooting a hole in the loaf of bread. So every time I think a gun, I think of a loaf of bread blowing up, all right? Two is shoe, I want to get a gallon of milk. I imagine myself pouring milk into the shoe. Three is tree, I want to get peas. So I imagine big pea pods hanging from a tree, you know, and four is floor. Floor, I might think of a can of peas, uh, baked beans sitting on the floor. So now if I go, one is gun. What is a gun blowing up? It's blowing up the bread, right? What's being poured into the shoe, which is number two? That's the gallon of milk. You know, three is tree. What's hanging from the tree? Pea pods, you know. Four is floor. What's on the middle of the floor? Baked beans all over the floor. So that's mnemonic. You associate that way. It gets much more complicated. Well, you can create like a location, like a memory palace. It goes back to the ancient It goes Greeks way and, back yeah. to the Greeks uh, when there was an earthquake and they couldn't remember who was at the table, but the, everybody sat in the exact same position at the table and there was somebody that was there so he could remember which seats were empty at the time so he was able to tell you who was killed and who wasn't there yeah have you read uh, moonwalking with einstein uh no i have not. josh four no I he's haven't. a world memory champion he, yeah. he's got ted talks on this the same type of thing but it's it's amazing how little people really value memory techniques nowadays now that you can just pull it all up on your smartphone and, and it is it a down. thing you have to apply though right if i don't apply it then i'm not getting use out of it and you have to apply it and you have to do it consistently unfortunately i don't do it consistently but i do do it consistently in my shows coming a little bit further forward to the million dollar challenge when you set up safeguards to, to protect from being fooled, to be being taken in or fleeced. Yeah. It's not so much about safeguards from being fooled and fleeced, right? Because I don't look at these people as purposely trying to fleece me or fool me because they could be self-deceived. And the majority of these people are self-deceived is the way it ends up turning out. But you still need them. the caveats in place. Though. But I need to have those caveats in place. I've got to have the protocol in place. But it also has to be done in such a way, we talked about the Project Alpha, where they're comfortable. So it's got to be something that they're comfortable with. And here's the thing, right? The majority of the psychics, the majority of the claimants, the people that have these uh, unusual claims, they are not comfortable with protocol. So it takes a long time to come up with a protocol that they're comfortable with, that they understand, yeah, we have to have protocol in place, but we're going to try and make you as comfortable as you can possibly be. And will the, your ability work within these confines? And if we cannot come to an agreement, then we can't test them because it has to be done to under proper scientific controls. But you try to come up with, with a way to test it that's still a fair test. A fair test. That, them, that they're happy with. That they say, yes, fair. I can perform under these conditions. It has to be fair. Yeah. Every time we test somebody, we have them state ahead of time, and we have them sign a piece of paper that says, this is within the realm of their abilities, that it is a fair test. Well, one example that I saw was you did a, a 
palm reader you had a palm reader come in and they had pictures of the hands and they could see all the lines and everything and they they gave a right. reading based off of that and we put gloves on every person the people were there but we put gloves on the people so they couldn't see anything and so they, they couldn't to... tell whose hands but they, right. the the pictures though they were able to see the the lines right on the hands but right. then they had to match the reading to to the individual to the individuals yeah yeah, they said they could do that. They said that will not be a problem. But the problem we find afterwards is when they fail, they always say, this is not what I normally do. Well, of course, it's not what you normally do because you don't normally work under proper scientific controls, right? There's no controls on what you're doing. She said, I need to have that interaction with the person. Well, that's exactly the problem, isn't it? Because the moment you get an interaction with those people, you are now getting feedback and you're getting feedback that's a visual feedback. It's not so much an emot- a, a, a psychic feedback anymore. And that's what we're trying to say is that you're often getting feedback from the person. You don't realize that's what you're doing, but that's what you're doing. We have to take that out of the equation. Well, your subconscious is so much more powerful than we realize. Like, uh, not not in a, a supernatural woo kind of way, but just in a, a sense of it's it's like a supercomputer, but yeah. the conscious part of it that you're aware of is a, only a very tip of the iceberg. There's people, a lot that you're taking in. That, people ask me in my shows that they say, you know, how do you choose specific people? And I know there's some reasons I choose specific people. I choose people that are engaging. I choose people that may look a little bit like, you know, that may be a little attractive on stage for certain effects because it plays that. And then other people I choose for a different look, you know, for something else that might be in the show. So I know there are specific reasons I choose people. And a lot of it has just become instinctive from doing shows over the years. But there are times I bring somebody up and they, after the show, come up to me, you know, I saw you four years ago and you brought me up for that exact same thing. This happens a lot. So there are specific things that I am looking for that I don't even realize I'm looking for. And it might just be that that person is engaging, laughing, or whatever it may be. I don't know what it is, but there are, it's my subconscious that's actually doing that for me at this point. So it's not just like, oh, I was wearing a red shirt, so I stood out because it's like years later they were in something else. and they're, That's know. exactly right. Yeah. Unless they were wearing the same red the shirt. The same red yeah, shirt. Yeah, yeah. yeah, which I doubt. I haven't been shopping in four years. Penn and Taylor have a show called Fool Us, and... Sometimes people have a new trick or a new technique of, of doing something that will stump some magicians had, who've been doing it for years. I have a very good friend that's fooled them multiple times. Yeah. If that's the case, have you ever worried that you would be fooled with the million dollar challenge? Or is it because Penn and Teller don't have the caveats, they don't have the, the safeguards? In this day and age, um, it's it's more and more likely we could be fooled, right? I mean, with the electronics and the things and the technology that's coming out, it makes it much, much more difficult than it used to be to test people. So you have to do like a test inside a Faraday cage or something to well, get rid of all external radio signals. But and, there might be something else that's yeah. going on, right? It's just there, there, there's just tech is that it's just advancing so fast that it really makes it hard sometimes for some of these things, and we got to find simple ways to. To, to simplify things, uh, to make it as simple as possible. And we have to search people now. We have to, that, that, that all has to be part of the protocol. It's, it's, yeah, I've been worried. There's been a couple of times I've been worried. There was one experiment that I couldn't be at. I don't want to say too much about it, but it was set up in such a way that I looked at it and I went, uh-oh. When I, when I showed up finally, and it was too late at that point because it was already into the experiment, I went, uh-oh, there is one way they could cheat with this wait a minute, there's two ways they could cheat with this. And thank goodness that person really believed they had an ability and they weren't trying to cheat. But if they wanted to cheat, they could have. Don't you have several rounds? Like if they pass That's the first exactly, one, then you move on to the next? And- exactly, yeah. And, and, and I put that in place because if I was able to find out that there was some little loophole that would have enabled them, whether it's statistically, whether it's visual, whatever it might be, um, that I could fix that in the next round. And that's only fair to them and fair to us as well because we're looking for somebody who has a true psychic ability, right? So if they say they have a true psychic ability, they certainly don't want people to say, yeah, but you could have been doing X, Y, Z because that's really not fair to them as well. And it's certainly not fair to us who have the prize. Now, here's the thing, right? It's a million dollar prize. Stats usually, when it will, it's something that can be done statistically, is one in a million. When you put both tests together, when you put the preliminary, which nobody passed, and the formal test together, we usually try to get it around about one in a million. People do win the lottery. It happens. So there is a possibility that they could just pass by luck alone the preliminary and the formal test because it's one in a million adding them together. So if they pass out tests, it doesn't mean they're psychic. Just like if they don't pass, it doesn't mean they're not. It might be indicative they're not. Maybe if they pass, it might be indicative that they are, but it would take other scientists and other research and other tests to find out whether they were a genuine psychic. Just because they pass out tests, they can't go around saying, yeah, I'm a real psychic. 
Now you have to take it into other laboratories and people have to replicate that research. Well, exactly. And that's why oftentimes you'll have parapsychologists that will get a positive result. But then as soon as it, you know, it goes to other labs and they try to test it and replicate it, it falls through. It falls through. And a lot of times we find out that maybe there was one little error or something that they weren't thinking about when they were actually conducting the tests. And we find that out time and time again. So you're not worried that someone, or I guess you are worried that with technology, people might come up with something, but we, we, we don't have, you the, have enough safeguards that, yeah, you know, we, we, sometimes it, it has to be within an environment that we need it to be in. You know, we had somebody that said that if, uh, uh EVPs, you know, electronic voice, you know, from the spirits, they could put a tape recorder down and, uh, it would pick up the spirits, but they wanted to do it at a specific location, a specific place. And, we, you know, of course, we started thinking about, you know, d direction, directional speakers and things and stuff like that. Are they going to be using something like that? Is it going to be something hidden in the ground? And we have to take all those things. So, yeah, we couldn't do it where they wanted us to do it. And that became, oh, this isn't fair. Yeah, you, you, you're, putting, you're putting these kind of rules on it. And I'm telling you I can do it at this particular place at this particular time. And so there are some things we just can't test under their conditions. We can't let them conduct the tests. I've noticed that as I've been making videos on psychics, I've, I've showcased some of your work and some of Randy's work and, and Dr. Ray Hyman and others. And I always get from when, when a, whenever a psychic stumbles across it, they always respond with things like, oh, well, th th these people are liars. They're actually, you know, psychics. They actually have abilities. You know, Randy is a psychic and he's, he's fooling people and lying. And invariably, when it comes to the million dollar challenge, they say it's it's unbeatable. That it's it's not a fair test, and it's not, you know, that they're they're just trying to to disprove this. And what what would even be the incentive to do something like that? One, and two, do you want? Are you setting out to disprove it, or are you setting out to know the truth? Like, would you like to know if there actually were? Well, paranormal if there powers. was a real paranormal thing, that's exactly what I'm looking for. I, I every time I would go into a test, I would put myself in the mindset of. I want to find somebody who's real. I hope this is a real person. But I wouldn't let that get in my way, and I wouldn't let my skepticism get in the way. I just let the science handle it itself. And the science will let me know whether this is real or whether it's not real. I'm not going to come in here with a negative attitude uh, because the science, uh, many psychics will tell you that, well, if you come in with a negative attitude, attitude you know, that, that, that interferes with the test. So I'm like, you know what? I'm not going to do that. I'm going to come in as if I actually sort of think it might be possible. Now, after you do it X amount of times and after you keep looking for it, and you don't find it, you start thinking, yeah, maybe it's not out there, right? And after each time you do it, you can kind of figure out what's going on or how they're self-deceived. You sort of come to a conclusion that more than likely this stuff is, is not real. I was talking to Ray Hyman earlier, and he said, you know, when he used to do palm reading, he was initially skeptical, and then he started getting positive results, and he thought, hey, maybe there's something to this. And then he reversed the reading. You would tell them the opposite of what the traditional palm reading books would tell you you're supposed to say. And people would say that they're extremely spot on. Yeah. And that it's just people are, are making stuff fit. It's it's a very psychological thing. He actually thing. got better feedback by giving them the wrong reading than the, the actual the right reading one. he was supposed to give them. Yeah. yeah. And, and, and that's what really convinced him. But if, if someone like that can start off as a skeptic and then suddenly be like, oh, maybe there's something to this, for any listener who is like, oh, well, I think I know how everything works, and then they suddenly go out and see something that they can't explain, yeah. you know, I, I want to encourage them that th that doesn't necessarily mean that there's not a actual, logical, natural right. explanation for I've it. I've always said, it, it, it is this thing, right? I, I say this in a lot of interviews. I'll, I'll just tell you the story. I used to do a lot of high schools, and one of the things I would do is I would perform, and if you've seen me perform, you know I try to make it look like I'm genuinely psychic. It's got to have that feel to it. I don't say that I am, but it's got to have that feel to it. A lot of mental, there's a thing called mental magic, and mental magic is where it looks like maybe it's trickery, but it's still entertaining and nobody knows how it's done. And then there's the way that I try to present it, which I want to look like I'm a psychic. How would a psychic present this? You know, there wouldn't be all this crazy long process, pick this, do that, do that, add this number, do these things. It's not going to be that kind of thing. It's going to look like it's genuine. So when I would get done performing, I would ask the students, I said, how many of you think this is real? And most of the hands would go up. Then I'd say, how many of you think it's not real? And four or five hands would go up, and I would ask each one of them. I would say, why do you think it's not real? Oh, because my dad told me it's not. Why do you think it's not real? I read an article that told me it wasn't. Why do you think it's not real? I saw a TV show a couple of days ago that said this stuff isn't real. And I would say, you're right. And they would get a big smile on their face. i say, but for the wrong reasons. 
I say, all these other kids just saw something that they couldn't explain. I understand why they may think it's real. But you're just telling me because somebody else told you that it's not, that's why you're saying it's not real. It's not real. But you're much better off saying, I don't know. Sometimes that's the smartest thing you can say is, I don't know, but you know what? I'm going to do some research. I'm going to go find some facts, and I'm going to really take a look at it from every single angle, and then I'm going to make a decision. But the sad thing is, even in school, in kindergarten, if a kid says, I don't know, everybody makes fun of them and says they're stupid. And sometimes saying, I don't know, is the smartest thing you can say. And at the very least, I don't know yet. Yes, I don't know yet. That, that's, that's actually a little bit smarter than I just don't know, because it means you're not just going to go, uh, unless uh, it's kind of like when you just say, I don't know, I guess, in the way that you just put it, it's kind of like saying, I don't care. Yeah. Right. I always say at the end of my show, I'm like, dare to be curious, yeah. but don't drink the Kool-Aid. Like, don't just be, you know, be open-minded, but not so open-minded that your brain falls out as a common right. you yeah. know, phrase in the, the movement. But I've, I've, just gone over time, but I had really wanted to ask you if I can keep you for two minutes longer. Absolutely, yeah. I, I really wanted to ask you about the Million Dollar Challenge, why it was retired, and then I also heard a rumor that you're bringing it back. Hmm, okay. So, what? My manager's looking at me is this, again. Is this, is this topic <laughs> off limits? Is this something um, in the works that you so want? I, I, I'm going to have to dance around this a little bit, and okay. then you and I can talk again someday, but I'll, I'll tell you what why it was retired. Um... Randy retired, so that was part of why it was retired. Uh, the other reason is the resources and the amount of resources that would go into trying to put protocol together for everybody and anybody that wanted to apply. We would spend more time, and I don't know how to say this in a very sensitive way because I always wanted to be sensitive and understanding. There are a lot of people out there who have some mental issues, you know, and we would get a lot of those people applying. And so we would always have to handle those people with kid gloves. But it was, I would literally spend, my manager who is sitting here, I've mentioned him a couple of times during this conversation, but he hasn't been heard. He still deals with a lot of emails and stuff that I get that, that have nothing to do with the million dollar challenge. Just the fact that I am a mentalist, that I get on stage and I do what I do. He deals with a lot of crazy, crazy emails. Back in the day when I was doing the million dollar challenge, I had death threats. Randy consistently had death threats. So we're dealing with a lot of you know, people that have mental issues as well, and we have to sort out the people that have mental issues from the people that truly believe they have these abilities. I think if we reboot it, it's going to be a little bit more done with a, a, a laser going after the things that we know we can go after, going after the psychics that are already out there, challenging them, and getting those people, maybe we will open it a few times a year, um, but not so much that we're spending all of our resources on stuff that's never going to happen, but rather than on things that actually can happen. So you're saying target people like the Peter Popoffs of the world that you know are fleecing people. And the John Edwards, the Von Progs. Now, maybe they won't take the challenge, just like Sylvia Brown said she was going to take it when she was alive, and she never did, so we put a, uh, a countdown clock on her. Um, but there are other people that are out there as well that aren't quite up at that level, that aren't making that kind of money that they don't care about a million dollars. So we can certainly target and go after those people. But I hate saying go after those people because it sounds like we're going after them to really... Uh, disprove them or to do something bad and that's not just showing our purpose. What's, what's really but just going giving on them a chance to show us that their abilities are genuine yeah no that that's really good is there anything that you would like to, to plug uh, our podcast banachek's brain uh which we talk about a little everything and uh, a lot of fun things and things like what we've talked about here right now uh you can find me online at banachek just put in punch in banachek any social media will come up for me or banachek at banachek.com fantastic and and to anyone too right now like go definitely go check out check out everything that he just mentioned i just did an interview with banachek you guys already uh, watch my show, so go find that over there. And, and while you're there, subscribe to the show and, and listen to it. And, and it's, it's going to be awesome. So I got to say, you're an amazing man. Really? You, you really are. I mean, just uh, talking to you earlier and doing the podcast with you, you truly are an amazing individual. Yeah. I, I, that, that means a lot to me. Thank you. And that's coming from one of my heroes. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for coming on. After my interview with Banachek, he published an interview he did with me on his podcast, Banachek's Brain, and it was a huge honor and a lot of fun. 
I'm putting a link to it in the description below, and while you're over there, subscribe to his show. He has tons of extremely fascinating content, and you won't be disappointed. And if you like what I'm doing here with Holy Kool-Aid, fighting harmful pseudoscience and dogma by promoting science-based education, please like and share this video, and consider supporting my work on a per-episode basis over at patreon.com slash holy kool-aid. Even just a buck helps a lot. Thank you for your ongoing support. If you like this video, I have a bunch more videos in this series on psychics. I highly recommend that you watch the whole playlist. And as always, dare to be curious, but don't drink the Kool-Aid.